So is your family ideal? I doubt few of us would, would actually say that. And in this series, it's, it's all about how, how can we live life in a more ideal way. It doesn't really matter what your family looks like, what the external composition of it is, you know, what your window sticker looks like. Uh, what really matters is how we live life together, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, please pray with me before we dive in. Father, we, uh, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for you, your clarity on uh, how, how we can do life better, whether we are in a family um, directly or whether we feel kind of removed from a family, just how we can live in a more ideal way with other people that you've put us in life with. So I invite you today to speak through me and uh, just, just give me what I need to speak clearly and to be on the right page with you. And, and Father, I pray you'd speak to each and every one of us where we are today, that, that we would leave this place knowing that we've heard from you with a word that we, uh, we, we are going to take with us and carry with us, a, a word that you will make fruitful this week. I ask this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, today we're going to talk about the world's oldest pastime. And it's not baseball. And it's not soccer. Um, the world's oldest pastime, do you know what it is? It's fighting over power. It is. I mean, that, that's what people have loved to do since the beginning of time. Playing tug of war with each other, arm wrestling each other, fighting over control and power. Power struggles are everywhere you look. I mean, just this last week or so, renewed tensions in Israel and Palestine. Man, I, I can take you back, you know, 4,000 years ago in Scripture, and, and you will see still tensions in those areas, fighting over land, fighting over control, fighting over power. But that's true not only internationally, that's also true domestically in, in our politics, right? All, all the fighting going on in Washington. Just this last week or so, um, John Boehner and the House have threatened to sue the president over an abuse of power. See, we've got this great government set up with, with division of, of power and checks and balances, and, and that's meant to keep tyrants from taking over. And yet, wh what it often does is it creates this power struggle where one branch of government is fighting for power over the other. You know, sometimes the noise you hear out of Washington Sounds a lot like the noise you hear out of your back seat on a, on a family car trip, right? I mean, it's, it's just bickering and pettiness and power struggle everywhere. You know power struggles in your workplace. I mean, fights over power and succession and org charts and titles and people get so worked up about these things. And that's true in every organization. Maybe, maybe the school, you know, PTA or PTL that you're a part of or, or your kid's baseball team. I mean, there's, there's power struggle there. What about our homes? We know power struggle in our homes. I love this cartoon. I'm not trying to change you. I'm trying to enhance you. <laughs> right? In, in marriage, so often, we're in these power struggles, right? We're, we're, we're trying to change the other person. We're trying to get the upper hand. And, and if that doesn't work, if we feel like it's not going our way, we start withholding. You know, hey, if, if, if you're not going to do what I want, if you're not going to give me what I want, then why should I give you what you want? And we get into these ugly power struggles even in our homes. You see, our, our sweet little families are not exempt. You don't have to go to Israel. You don't have to go to Washington to find people fighting for power. Often, in our very homes, we're struggling for it. And so today, we're going to ask this important question as it relates to family. Uh, who's the boss? Who wins in all of the power struggles that happen in your family? Now, in this picture, if your family's anything like mine, you, you just kind of, you, 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 you uh, write a truce and you say, okay, mom and dad are going to eat salad, the kids can eat pizza. Uh, you let everyone win, or, or at least you try to. But in your family, who's the boss? In your mind right now, answer that question. In your family, who's the boss? And then, and then turn to the person next to you and uh, tell them, who's the boss? And then duck. Because <laughs> that's a dangerous question to ask, and it's an even dangerous, more dangerous question to answer, isn't it? Uh, the other night I was hanging out with uh, Jeff and Laura Cook. Jeff's on staff here, and uh, my wife and I were hanging out with his wife and, uh, and, and Jeff, and, uh, and they knew we were teaching on this, and they said, so yeah, who, who is the boss in your family anyway? And I got really quiet, because my wife was sitting there, and I mean, how do you answer that question? But neither one of us really knew how to answer that question. It's a very dangerous question to answer, and yet it's an important question to answer, because power struggles, arm wrestling matches, tug of wars, they happen daily in our families. And that's why today I want to share with you a word that is, that is revolutionary. It, it was revolutionary when it was written 2,000 years ago, 
and it addresses this question, who's the boss, with, with such wisdom that, uh, that it really changed families and it changed societies when it was first spoken. And I believe if we let it, it can change our families as well. It's a word that some of you have, have read before or heard before. Uh, frankly, it's a word that we don't like very much. It comes from Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Uh, right now you can open up your Bibles to that. You can go to uversion.com on your smartphone, and uh, you can go to our live event there. Type in STGSTL to search for our live event, or you can look along right here on the screen. Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 21. Paul's writing to these uh, believers in Ephesus, uh, a city uh, in Rome and in the Roman Empire, and he says this. He says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he goes on. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, he's got an analogy here, so now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. <laughs> I love this, right? Wives should submit to their, should submit to their husbands in, in everything. Now, now look at this analogy. Now as, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. I, I know some of you women are thinking right now, my husband is not Jesus. Right? That's all fine if the church is going to submit to Christ, but you don't know him. He is no Jesus. And so this whole idea of submitting to him in everything, Jesus, okay, my husband, not a chance. Right? I mean, th th these are crazy words. I mean, they don't sound revolutionary at all. They sound archaic, don't they? I mean, you're looking at these words and you're thinking, okay, okay, I get it. You know, Paul was writing to a very paternalistic society and that's how things were back then. And maybe these words made sense to people living 2,000 years ago. But aren't we way, way past these words? It gets better. Read on. Uh, he says, husbands, love your wives. And, and just a note here, um, I, I'm going to read through this section. And, and Paul, he gets a, he gets a little rambly. With all due respect, he does. He starts going off on tangents and rabbit trails, which just is, is proof that it can happen to the best of us, okay? So uh, we won't judge him too harshly. But what I did through this section, it's kind of long, and I don't want you to get lost in the weeds. So what I did is I highlighted the key phrases that I want you to hold on to, the key points that he makes. So, uh, so wives, submit to your husband, because the husband is the head. Submit to your husband uh, in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, verse 26, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, this is where he gets a little rambly, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way then, husbands, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church, for we are all members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, back, back, back to the subject at hand, he says, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, some of us are nodding along, and some of us are thinking, this is insane. Are we really going to talk about this today? I can't believe I, I got up and got dressed and took a shower for this. And yet, you know, part of the problem with this section of Scripture in particular is that we, uh, we stop there, because there's a chapter break, these arbitrary breaks that people put in later. Um, but, but Paul's not finished. We think this is all about gender, but it's about something much greater. I want you to read on. The very next verse, the very next verse happens to be in a new chapter, but the very next verse, he goes on. He says, children, obey your parents. Uh, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he, he quotes the old commandment, one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment that's given a promise. He continues, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So he goes back to this commandment. He says, children, you were told long ago, Obey your parents, and there's a blessing if you do. Then he continues. He says, now fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and, the, and instruction of the Lord. Then he says, slaves, 
or indentured servants is really who we're talking about here, but, uh, but people who are bond slaves. He says, obey your earthly masters. This is kind of hard for us, but, but, but listen to what he says. He says, do it with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. So don't just obey them because, because they're your master, but, but do it as if they were Christ themselves. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they're slave or free. And then masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Now, do you notice, Paul addresses six different groups of people uh, in these words. Uh, Three of those groups of people are people who are highly empowered. They are people with rights and freedoms. They are at the top of the food chain. Three of those groups are highly empowered, and three of those groups are highly disenfranchised. Did you notice? Uh, So so he talks to to, uh, husbands and uh, and masters and fathers, and and then he talks to uh, women who in the ancient world were seen as little more than property. He talks to children who were seen as a means to an end uh, in many places. And he talks to slaves which had no legal standing at all. Three highly disenfranchised groups. And most of us, when we read these words, those are the three groups that we focus on. And, And that's what gets us so bent out of shape. Because here we think this man of God, Paul, is supporting the systematic oppression of these entire uh, groups of people. And we just think, man, how could Paul stand for that? How could, how could Paul stand for women being oppressed and, and children being mistreated and abused and, and slaves being abused? How could a man of God actually advocate for that stuff to happen? And you see, our problem is we get so busy being offended by those three groups of people and what Paul says to them that we forget that he actually spoke to six groups of people. Three that are highly empowered three that are highly disenfranchised, and you notice his, his word to them, his call to them, is exactly the same. It started back in, in uh, uh, Ephesians 5. Um, he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. See, no matter whether you're, you're male or female, slave or free, parent or child, Paul, Paul says, you're all called to do the same thing. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's what I want you to do, Paul says. No matter who you are, whether slave or free, male or female, pan or children, submit to one another. Now see, most of the time we're so focused on, on, on those, those other groups and, and we go, okay, well I get that women had to submit and children had to submit and, and slaves have to submit and, and that just seems so awful. But think about how revolutionary these words are to those other three gr- people groups. To the husbands and the, and the masters and the, uh, the, uh, the fathers, right? I mean, Paul's basically saying, hey guys, I, I know in society, culturally, you've got all the power. You've got all the rights. You've got all the authority. And yet, I'm calling you to yield your power for the good of others. That's what submitting is. It's, it's yielding your power for the good of others. So, so that's what Paul says. Now, now, who does that in their right mind? Right? That's not how the world works. When you've got power, when you finally get power, you don't let go of it. That's why we've got people in Congress who've been there for 60 years. You know, they may not be able or even care about serving the public anymore, but, but they've got power. And they're going to hold on to it. That's why, that's why you, you see power struggles in corporations and, and people don't want to let go of power. Because in our, in our culture, when you get power, if you have power, the last thing you do is ever let it go. So why would a husband, a, a father, a master ever yield his power for someone else? He wouldn't. It's ridiculous that Paul would say this to them, right? And it is ridiculous. No, no one would do that. Unless that person really gets what Jesus Christ did for them. See, there's no way that that any of us will ever yield our power, whatever power we have, unless we really get what Jesus has done for us. That Jesus, someone who had all power and authority, who in very nature 
was in very nature God and did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, that he didn't come and lord it over us, but he humbled himself. He took on the very nature of a servant. He submitted himself. He yielded to us in our needs and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, the scriptures say. See, why would Jesus do that? I don't know. He must know something different about power. Something, he must think about it in a way that's different than all of us. And I'm telling you, the, the only way that someone who has power would ever let go of it is if they really get that, that if that's good enough for Jesus, if that's what Jesus has done, and by that, because Jesus submitted himself to us, we now have life and freedom and salvation and eternity. It's only when they fully get that that they'll yield their power too. See, it's only when you are so filled with love, and, and, and the word here is reverence, reverence for what Jesus has done for you, that he used every drop of his power, not for his benefit, but for yours. It's not until you really get that, that your heart will begin to be changed, and that you really start to consider what Paul said, whether you are empowered or disenfranchised, that, that we are all called because of Jesus and what he's done for us to submit ourselves to one another out of reverence for him. See, this is not about obligation for Paul. This is not about culture or society or, or, or different customs. See, Paul is speaking to people who, who are above all of that. Sure, some of them may live in cultures or societies where, where women are treated a certain way and, and, and men are treated in a different way, but Paul isn't speaking to people as if they're different. Paul's not speaking to citizens of Rome or, or Israel. He's speaking to people who are in Christ. People who've been baptized into Christ. And, and that makes everything different for Paul. See, part of the reason we struggle with these words is because is we don't understand Paul's mindset here. As Paul writes these words, he's not speaking to people who are, who are elevated over others. He's speaking to people who are equally valued. You know, in our country, we say all men are created equal. For Paul, it wasn't that we were created equal, it's that, that we are all equally redeemed, that we all stand level at the foot of the cross. And, and you need to know that no matter how important you are in, in life, no matter how many people report to you or submit to your authority or, 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 or what, what salary you make or, or what power or influence you have in this world, when you come in here, we are all level, right? Right? Because we are all fallen. We all fall so short of God's incredible ideals for us. We are all guilty of, of offending each other and not living as we should. We're all mess ups. And yet, that's not what Paul's talking about. What Paul is talking about is this value that comes over us because Jesus gave his life for all of us, each and every one of us. I mean, that's why women were the, the witnesses of the resurrection. I mean, why did God in his wisdom select women? to be the witnesses, women who had no standing or credibility in their culture, to be the witnesses of, of the greatest event that ever happened. Because he's sending a message that we are all equally valued as far as redemption is concerned. Because Jesus gave his life, we all are of equal status. So Paul's not writing to, to men who are empowered and women who are disempowered. Paul goes, no, I'm writing to people who are in Christ. And when you are in Christ, I don't care what your society says. I don't care what your circumstances are. We are all equally valued. He goes on and he says, in Christ, we are all completely liberated. Paul's writing these words while he's in prison. Doesn't sound like it. Because Paul says, you know what, even though I'm a prisoner, even if you're a slave, even if you're in some situation where, where you don't have complete freedom, in Christ, you are completely free. You're free from sin and death and the power of the devil. More than that, you're set free to discover a life of true wholeness. See, often we talk about choice and personal freedom as if it's a human value, and it's not a human value. I believe it's a human right, but I believe it's only a human right because it's a Christian value. It's not a human value. See, this idea that we are all free, that we should be free to decide and free to choose and, and free, to, free to live life, 
the way we, we know best to live, that's not a human value. Go to a place where, where the gospel has never been preached and you will not find that to be a value there. That is a distinctly Christian value. It is a Christian ideal and it comes from the gospel that, that in Jesus Christ, he so loved us that he laid down his power to set us free. We're completely liberated and we're also compelled, but we're never coerced. See, Paul knows when he's writing that he's writing to a group of people who are free to do what they want. And, and, and so he will compel them, but he will not force them to do anything. Because God never forces himself on us. Do you know that? God's way is to, is to compel us, to woo us, to try to convince us to do things in life that are good, to make good choices, to, to make choices that will lead us toward life, but, but he never forces himself on us. Do you know that? I mean, just read through the scriptures. You see a God who is trying to make a compelling case all the time, but you never see a God who is forcing his way with us. And, see, and so, so we get Paul all wrong here as he writes. See, Paul writes these words, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In his mind, he's, he's writing to a group of people who are equally valued and who are completely liberated, uh, who, who he is not going to coerce, but he will compel. And he says, you know what, I want you to willfully submit yourselves to one another. Not because you have to, but because you want to. Do you see how revolutionary these words are now? I mean, for the first time, for the first time, Paul's looking at women who have no choices in their society. And he's saying, in Christ, you've got all the freedom you could ever want. And, and instead of submitting to your husband because the law says you have to, I'm inviting you. I'm, I'm speaking to you as a person with freedom and options. And I'm saying willingly choose to submit yourself to your husband. See, these words are revolutionary, but we never think about them like that because we're so afraid of losing power. So, so back to this question about the balance of power, this question, who's the boss in our families? Who's the boss in our life? The answer is, Paul's answer would be, in Christ, if you are in Christ, who cares? <laughs> Paul's answer would be, if you are in Christ, then anyone around you is your boss. Because if you're following Christ, your goal is not to lord it over people, because that's not what Christ did. If you are in Christ, your goal is to do what Christ did, and that is to serve everyone around you, to use whatever power or authority or influence you have for the good of others in your life. See, this call to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, it applies equally to all of us irrespective of our position. See, if, if you're caught up on who's the boss, if, if that's a question that burns in your heart, you just need to ask God's spirit in to help you have the attitude of Christ. Because wanting to wield authority over people, being hungry for that, it is not from God. That said, it's important for us to realize that as we submit to one another, and we all do that equally, and we all do that evenly, submission does look different depending on the relationship. So, so let's talk about marriage, because that's where all this tension comes up, right? You know, the husbands and the wives stuff. So, so if we're submitting to each other equally, and it's all egalitarian, we like that part, but that doesn't mean that submission looks the same to each other. And, and if I could just speak in generalities for a minute, uh, l let, me, let me do it in this way. Like, I, I believe... I believe, gen generally speaking, um, that, that men and women have many things that are innately similar in them. I, I believe that men and women innately want in their relationships, they want to be known and respected and loved and cared for, and, and, uh, and they want safety and security, and they want vulnerability um, and companionship. I, I believe that men and women want that. Um, I also believe, though, that men and women innately want things that are different. And that's why I think Paul wrote these words, specifically speaking to husbands and wives, who are called equally to submit, and he summarizes it this way, wives, submit, to your, uh, submit yourselves to your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. 
And husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See, Paul is calling to people who are equally called to submit out of reverence for Christ. But the way that they will submit looks different because of what the other person needs. See, see uh, I think in, in uh, men and women, uh, one of the key differences between men and women is this, that men innately are created with the desire to be respectable. And women are created with the desire to be lovable. See, I think there are lots of other differences between men and women, but I think this is a key difference, and this is one that Paul picks up on. And uh, you may be a man sitting here and say, well, I don't, I don't feel that way. Or a woman who sits there and says, I don't, I don't feel that way. Uh, I'm speaking generally. And, and I believe in a created way that you are, you are created, um, rather, with a, uh, a desire to feel these things. And, and maybe you don't feel them anymore because life changes things. But, but, but I believe this is true. Now, 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 if this is true, if this is true, and you don't have to believe it's true, but just if this is true, follow me. If this is true, that we're created with these differences as men and women, and if it's also true that Paul says, hey, you're equally valued, you're equally liberated, uh, I want to compel you, not coerce you, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Doesn't it make sense that if you're in a marriage, and you're a woman, and you're married to a man who, who has an innate desire to be respectable, that, that's what he longs for deep down, is to be someone who is worthy of respect. Even, even, if, even if his actions don't show it, that's what he longs for. Well, if you're going to submit to that person out of reverence for Christ, doesn't it make sense that you would do so in a way that makes him feel respected? If his greatest desire is to be respectable, then submitting to him means putting his needs first and finding a way to make him feel respected. Do you get that? And, and in the same way, if a women are created with this, this desire to be lovable, uh, and, and I, I'm in a marriage and I'm going to submit to my wife out of reverence for Christ, if I'm going to put her needs above my own, and one of her greatest needs is the desire to be lovable, then doesn't it make sense that the way I would submit to her is by making her feel loved, meeting her in that desire to feel lovable and making her feel loved? See, see this is where, speaking to married people, this is where marriage gets all crazy for us, is that somewhere along the way we get all dug in about what our needs are and whether our needs are being met, and we use our power and authority to make demands on each other. And yet, and yet if, you, if, you, if you want a marriage that's, that's truly uh, closer to the ideal, it's not about that. It's, it's saying, how do I use my power and my authority for the good of the other to, to meet them in their needs? And see, if you're a married person, uh, this is stuff you should be asking all the time. Instead of being preoccupied with what, thinking about what you need all day long, think about what, what your spouse needs. Uh, let me point out something else here that Paul does that we often miss. As he's calling wives to submit to their husbands and husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, nowhere in there does he say, husbands, make your wives submit to you. Right? It's not there. And nowhere in there does he say, wives, nag your husband into loving you. You know, make him give you compliments. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. See, I love what Paul does. It's in one letter, but he's very specific about who he's speaking to with which instruction. And it's almost like he's saying, he's saying, wives, let me speak to you for a second. Husbands, plug your ears. Wives, I just want to speak to you. So, you know, husbands, plug your ears. No amening out of you. I don't want you listening to this. This is none of your business. Wives, all right, the husbands aren't listening. Wives, let me tell you something. If you want to melt your husband, if, if you want to love him, if you want to honor him, if, if you want to submit to him out of reverence for Christ, j just make him feel respected because it's what he wants more than anything. He wants to be a man who's worthy of respect. So give it to him. And of course, all the wives hear that, hear Paul say that, and they go, submit to him? Mm -mm -mm. What about him? Right? And Paul goes, no, 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 I, I've got a word for him, but, but that's not any of your business, really, because you can't control what I'm going to say to him. All you can control is how you submit, and if you really want to melt your husband, if, if you really want to, uh, to just you know, set your husband's heart on fire, make him feel like he's a man worthy of respect. And then he goes over to the husbands, and he says, all right, all right, wives, you plug your ears, husbands, husbands, uh, I've got to tell you something. If you really want your marriage to, to be ideal, and if, if you want to, to just really bless your wife, Make her feel loved, deeply loved. I mean, lay down your life for her. Do whatever is necessary to, to meet her 
needs. Just, just, just put yourself consistently behind her and love her with a Christ-like love. And the husband's going, well, what about her? What if she's, you know, and he goes, no, 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 <laughs> you can't control her because we're not about controlling each other, right? We're equally valued. We're equally free. We're, we're not coercing each other. We're compelled but not coerced. So he says, let, let me just tell you what to do and you control what you do and this is how you submit to one another. See, when Paul is speaking these words, he's not speaking to people who are in power and people who are oppressed. It's not it. He's speaking to people who are equally valued, people who are completely free, and he's compelling them. And he's saying, you know what? The message for all of us is the same. If it was how Jesus lived his life, it's got to be the same for all of us, that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, keeping in mind that the way we submit to each other looks different depending on who you are. Now, now that's not to say, let me close with this, that's not to say that everyone plays the exact same part in a family. Um, so, so back to this question of who's the boss in the family. Part of us is, you know, whoever is in need is my boss. I'm here to serve the people in my family. And yet I will say this, that ideally speaking, God's intention is, as you just saw here in Ephesians, God's intention is that the husband would be the head of his family. And his intention is that parents would lead their children, not the other way around. And sometimes I, I, I look at our culture, our society, and I think we've got a lot of families that are being led by the whims of kids, and I don't think that's healthy. Uh, we don't talk about masters and slaves, but, 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 I believe, uh, but I believe that bosses should lead their employees, and, and, uh, and, and elected officials should lead their citizenry, and, and pastors should lead their churches. Not because one's better than the other, no, I just told you that's not true. That's not how Paul's thinking about this. But the reason is, is because everyone needs a leader. And God is a God of order. Someone's got to lead, and God likes order, and so he establishes it. And we all know what happens. We all know what happens when people fail to lead. When politicians lead by what opinion polls say, we don't solve any of our problems, do we? And when companies... When, when they don't have strong leadership who actually lead the vision, when, when people just do whatever they want, companies go belly up. And the same is true with families. Families, where everyone is trying to be in charge, that's called anarchy. And it is so far from God's ideal. See, ideally speaking, there is order, because God likes order. And he asks husbands to submit to Christ, and then he asks families to let the husband lead. Now here's what I know. I, telepathically right now I'm being barraged by all of your objections and questions. I can feel the weight of them uh, coming on me right now and I can't answer all of those things. But here's, here's what I know. Today I'm speaking about ideals. And uh, I realize that all of our families aren't going to live this out like we're supposed to. We all fall short every day of God's ideals, all the time. All of us do. And uh, further, we as people are broken, and we are insecure, and we are in relationships with people that are broken and insecure. We're a mess. I realize that some families have no father, or some families have a father who is in no position to lead. I get it. So, so maybe your situation isn't ideal, and maybe it never will be. But what I'd ask you today is, is can you still accept the ideal that exists even if you can never reach it? I'll say that again. Can you accept the ideal that exists even if you may never reach it? And further, can you try to work toward it anyway? See, again, regardless of your situation, uh, whether, whether or not you feel empowered or not, see, the call is the same for all of us. And the call is to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And, and, and here's what I know, that there was a group of people once upon a time who lived this out so fully, they were so devoted to this idea that power was meant to be used to serve one another, and they submitted and they yielded to each other out of reverence for Christ, that it changed families, and it changed communities, it changed all of society, it even changed the world. It happened 2,000 years ago with the people who first received these words from Paul. And here's what I believe. I may be an idealist, but here's what I believe. That if we would embrace these words, it would also change our families today.
It would change our society. It would change our nation. I believe it would change our world. In fact, that's what I want to pray about today as we uh, close this service. Please stand as we pray. Pray with me. Father, uh, I ask, I invite you to, uh, to come in and just help us do this, this, this yielding, submitting thing. We all are terrible at it. We're, we're so fearful and we hold on to power. We're afraid of being abused. We're afraid of having our rights infringed upon. But I, Father, I just pray you'd give us the heart of Christ who wasn't afraid of any of those things. Instead, he just loved us with a pure, unselfish love. Father, give us that kind of uh, heart so that we could truly love people around us and we could submit to one another out of reverence for Christ and we could leverage our power for the good of others, not ourselves. Father, I pray that you'd help us do this in families and I know today that there are some families in this room that are really hurting. And Father, uh, maybe this is a part of it and I, I just ask that you'd begin to do a healing work in those families that you put a resolve in, in all members of the family to begin to submit to one another because you're a God who submitted to us. So Father, I pray that you begin to transform our hearts and our minds and our families, make them more ideal, change our society, change our country. But start with us, here, now, each of us in our hearts. Help us be more like Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, on just a second, 